All right, if I had to pick one topic and say, it's definitely gonna be on your exam, so know something about it, it would be this one, data analytics. For BEC, for audit, you're not getting through those exams without a good understanding of these terms. For each numbered item, choose from the list the correct choice. An item in the list may be selected once, more than once, or not at all. On the exam, you'll probably get a drop-down menu, but it's a lot easier to see a big list like this. So we'll go through it this way. Some of the terms in this sim you may not have seen before in an I-75 video. So let's go through some of these. So we'll go over each one on this list, starting with the term big data. And that's a term you have seen in I-75 videos. What is big data? And you should probably take some notes here as we go over these terms. Big data include large amounts of data that are collected from various sources, including social media, devices that are hooked up to the internet, videos. This data could be structured, it could be unstructured. And that brings us to some new terms, structured data, unstructured, and semi-structured data. What do those mean? Structured data are highly organized into predefined groupings and typically maintained in what's called relational databases. Structured data can easily be sorted and searched by computer programs. That's the advantage of structured data. Easy to search. A balance sheet is an example of structured data. Why? It's structured. It's anticipated that you'll find assets, liabilities, equity. It's highly structured. It's well-defined. And within the assets, you'll find current assets and non-current assets. You expect to find current liabilities and non-current. Structured data file types include numbers, addresses, dates. They're generally maintained by structured query language, something you need to know on the exam called SQL. All you need to know about it is it's used for managing relational databases. So SQL relates to structured data. Structured data is highly organized as opposed to unstructured data. Unstructured data, little or no predefined organizational structure, and this lack of organization makes the data much more difficult for computer programs to search, sort, and analyze. Financial statement footnotes are unstructured, whereas the balance sheet was structured, the footnotes are unstructured, and so are things like tweets on Twitter, photos uploaded to Facebook. These are unstructured data, more difficult for computer programs to analyze. Unstructured data, that includes text, audios, videos, images, and what you need to know about unstructured data is they're maintained by non-relational databases or no SQL. Just the opposite of what we saw up here with structured data where it's maintained in SQL. And just as we get comfortable with structured data and unstructured, we find out that there's something known as semi-structured data. And that falls in between the structured and the unstructured because semi-structured data are not as highly organized as structured data, but like we see with XML and XBRL, semi-structured data can be converted and stored in relational databases for analysis. So semi-structured data becomes structured because it can be organized. It can be converted and stored in relational databases. And an example would be XML and XBRL. So we started with big data, then we went on to structured, semi-structured, and unstructured. Now I wanna mention the four Vs of big data, veracity-based value, volume-based, velocity-based, and variety. And if you say these too fast, they kind of sound like each other, right? Velocity and veracity, not a lot of difference there in the way they sound, but they're very different terms. So let's look at all four, the four Vs of big data. Next, we have variety-based value. The idea that data exists in a wide variety of file types, and we just talked about that variety. We have structured data, we have semi-structured data, and we have unstructured data. That wide variety delivers value. And just like veracity, variety is one of the four Vs of big data. Now for the other two. Next we have velocity-based value. Velocity should make you think of speed. Velocity-based value involves rapid analysis capabilities in order to provide businesses with the right decision in time to achieve their customer relationship management objectives. So you've got to know the four Vs of big data, and so far we have three of them. So what's the last one? 
volume. The extreme amount of data captured over time is what we call volume-based value. And the goal of volume-based value is for a business to obtain more data on their customers, both recent customers, historical, for even greater insights. In fact, the number of servers required that a company needs is directly related to the volume of data needed to be collected. So there we have the four V's of big data. So here we are getting ready to do this very important sim on data analytics. And we're going through the list to make sure we understand what these terms mean. We started with big data. Then we went to structured, semi-structured, and unstructured. And then the four V's of big data. What about the term data analytics? Well, data analytics involves retrieving data from data sources and then inspecting the data based on data type to facilitate the decision-making process. Data analytics uses both qualitative and quantitative methodologies and procedures to retrieve the data out of data sources. All right, what about this term over here, data scrubbing or data cleaning? Same thing. All right, data scrubbing or cleaning involves fixing errors in data flushing out useless information and identifying missing data. Now from data scrubbing down here, we move up here to data normalization. What does that mean? Data normalization focuses on storing each data element as few times as possible after useless information is flushed out and data has been cleaned. The process of data normalization strengthens data integrity. So in data analytics, once the data has been scrubbed and cleaned, then it's been normalized and we can store it and we store it as few times as possible. And that process strengthens data integrity. Now let's look at the term data fusion. When we hear the term fusion, what do we think of? Usually we're bringing things together, separate, isolated things. They'll come together and be better together than they were individually. And that's what data fusion does. So data fusion is the process of integrating data and knowledge, representing the same real world object in a more consistent, accurate, and useful representation than the individual sources would be in isolation. So when your GPS predicts traffic patterns, that's what they do. They fuse together data and knowledge representing the same real world object, which is the traffic but it's presented to you in a more consistent, accurate, and useful representation compared to the individual sources in isolation. The individual sources might be, it knows the speed, the miles per hour that you're traveling. It also would take into consideration if there's an accident ahead. It would also know how many cars are ahead of you. So this is data fusion. All right, let's go to data management now. What's data management? So data management or data governance ensures data are of high quality and well governed before they can be reliably analyzed. So data management is taking that tone at the top view of data analytics. Because the theory is if you don't have good data management, then what? You're not gonna have reliable data analytics. Okay, what's anomaly detection? Well, what is an anomaly? It's something that's not easily understood at face value. So anomaly detection is used to identify unusual patterns or deviations from expected results. And one of the best things about data analytics is anomaly detection, the ability to identify unusual patterns or deviations from expected results. But only if you have what? Good data management. What's next? Let's look at in-memory analytics. In-memory analytics refers to analyzing data from system memory instead of secondary storage. So instead of looking at the hard drive, you're going right into system memory to analyze data. And that achieves immediate results by removing the need for data preparation and avoids analytical processing delays. So advantages of in-memory analytics include speed and reduce cost. So in-memory analytics is a key technology of big data and you should know that term. All right, what about text mining? Well, text mining sounds like data mining. So let's go over data mining first. Data mining is the process of using statistical techniques 
to extract and analyze data from large databases to discern patterns and trends. Data mining examines large amounts of data to discover patterns using statistical models and techniques. And data mining is key technology of big data. Great, so what's text mining? Text mining is a key technology of big data that analyzes text from the web, often from comments made in forum like a Facebook group. Think of the CPA exam Facebook groups. How much new information is contained in those forums and Facebook groups? You may have learned about I-75 from such a forum. So text mining, the key technology, often from comments made in forums or maybe from customer emails and other text-based sources through the use of machine learning in order to identify new topics. So that's the key to text mining. The company's looking for some new topics that they didn't even know existed. An example of text mining would be using the text from online reviews written by customers. Text mining is a key technology of big data and customer information is generally text data and customer information extraction generally requires text mining. Remember, customer information is generally text. It's not video, it's not photos or images, it's usually text, especially customer reviews. And extracting things like customer information requires text mining, a form of data mining. So when I think of text mining, I think of text information contained in customer reviews or in Facebook groups in order to obtain new information. And that brings us to the last column over here, prescriptive, predictive, descriptive, and diagnostic analytics. Got to know those four. All right, starting up here with descriptive analytics, that's the most basic and commonly used data analytics, and it concentrates on the reporting of actual results. Descriptive analytics answers the question, what is happening or what just happened? Maybe what is happening is that sales are increasing, but profits are decreasing. Descriptive analytics answers the question, what's happening? What just happened? Independent auditors are most interested in descriptive analytics because it has to do with historic actual results. What just happened? Then there's diagnostic analytics answers the question, why did it happen? And provides insight on the reason certain results occurred. So if descriptive analytics answers what just happened or what is happening, diagnostic answers why did it happen or why is it happening. Now predictive analytics answers the question what is likely to occur next. So a common use of predictive analytics occurs when a customer selects an item to purchase online and prepares to finalize the transaction. So let's say you go to buy an airline ticket and you finalize the transaction you're about to pay and the web page then displays additional products that other customers purchased at the same time, such as car rental or hotel. This would be Expedia's use of predictive analytics, predicting what you will need based on what you just bought. So predictive analytics answers the question, what is likely to occur next? Someone just booked a hotel reservation, what are they likely to need next? Now, prescriptive analytics down here answers the question, how should we respond? And concentrates on what an organization needs to do for the predicted future results to actually occur. Prescriptive analytics applies advanced statistical methods. For example, if we know that sales are increasing but profits are decreasing, if that's what just happened, and we just figured out why it happened or why it's happening, then predictive analytics would answer the question, what's likely to occur next? And what's likely to occur would be we would have a loss instead of profits. And then prescriptive analytics, what should we do about it? How should we respond? So now that we know something about these terms, we can start the SIM. Number one asks, fixing errors in data, identifying missing data, and flushing out useless information. What would that have to do with? Which one of these up here? After you like and subscribe, Leave me a comment, what you think the correct answer is. And if you go to cpaexamtutoring.com and subscribe to the I-75 course, you can see this entire sim and all 20 numbered items. Make sure that you're ready for BEC and audit in this key area of data analytics.